well without boasting. Like, there's no kebab shop in Melbourne that comes close to us. And I'm shaving the chicken with a sword. It came with his electric slice, and I was just like, wow. Like, <laughs> I remember the cops called me up once. They're like, hey, Sada, are you aware of the protest? I'm like, what protest? I had headlines along the lines of David versus Goliath, or right. small business owner versus corporate giant, or something along those lines. Welcome to the Come Up Starter Kit, guys. This show is all about taking your career from zero to 100 real quick. If you are lost, confused, or just plain stuck, I'm here to help. Now, who am I? I'm Shane Kapilai, your soon-to-be favorite career coach. With over seven years' experience in the recruitment game, there's nothing I haven't seen, and I help people just like you land that dream job. In each episode, we'll speak to one of my friends who's done something a little bit different in their career. We'll go along the journey and understand what they've done that's made them so successful. Along the way, I'll give you tips and tricks to help you with your own very come up. Let's get it. Welcome to the Come Up Starter Kit, guys. My name is Shankar, and I have a very special guest with me today, Asad Syed, who is the founder of Glenny Kebabs and the king of kebabs as well. Now, guys, this episode is very, very dear to myself. I've known Asad for a very long time, and he's also from my neighborhood, Glen Waverley, so it's always good to see someone doing great things. Thank you, Asad. No worries. Thanks for having me on your show. Thank you. Now, Asad, to give the people a rundown of who you are, can you sum up your life in 60 seconds? Brought up in Glen Waverley. I think around 16, 17, I uh, started up events in Glen Waverley area to make some money and sort of save up for my first car. From there, I got poached by a couple of guys and they wanted me to start running functions and events with them in the city and sort of surrounding areas. Took a break from that scene and ran the family business for around two, three years. And then I was like, you know what, it's time to venture out to myself and do my own thing and just grow what we can. And that's where Glenny Kebabs came from there. Wonderful. Now, Asad, how did Glenny Kebabs start? Because this is a very interesting story. My original stores was on Springwell Road, just next to the Caltex petrol station. Now, guys that have lived in Glen Waverley for some time will know that was called Bambino's Kebabs. The whole module of that business was a little bit confusing. So it was a Turkish kebab shop uh, with an Italian name with uh, Indian menu items also on there. And it was run in a heavily Chinese community. And um, yeah, it just didn't make sense. For example, you could go there, ask for a kebab and it's gonna offer you biryani and samosas. Like it just, it didn't make sense. And I like the, the, the management was just poor. The staff didn't know what they're doing. So for example, like my brother went once, I remember, and he went there and he ordered a kebab, you know, chips and drink, the normal sort of kebab meal. And the guy's coming, goes to my brother Nabil. He goes, can you just stand here for five minutes and I'll be back? My brother's thinking, yeah, no worries. Thinking, you know, he's probably going to the back room or something. My brother's physically seen this guy run across the road to the Glen, to the Coles, <laughs> and he comes back with uh, chips and bread. It's just not normal. That's what we were working with. That's the business that uh, we eventually took over. Yeah. And that's how you identified an opportunity. Yes. Oh, absolutely, man. Being in Glen Waverley, like when people ask, let's go for cabs. That wasn't the place we wanted to go. It's not the place I wanted to go. It's not a place anyone I want. I know wanted to go. You drive past, it's just always dead. They've survived for a couple of years, but there was definitely no growth in that business. So Perfect. yeah. All right, guys. Now in this sit down, we're going to sit with Assad a little bit more and deep dive into his business career. All right, Asad, so what I want to do is give the audience a bit of a background and story about how you actually put your plan into action to get Glenny Kebabs up and running. So going back to that uh, shop I was selling in Glen Waverley, I poached him and I said, look, I want to, I'm interested in buying out your lease. I don't want the business, I want to start something new, right. but I just want that spot. And the reason I wanted that spot is because of its location. Like it's in the heart of Glen Waverley. You've got Glen Waverley train station, where people come for Deakin Uni, Monash Uni, such and such. You've got yeah. Glen Waverley High School, Highwell Secondary, Brentwood, like all the schools are in the area. You've got the Glen itself. You've got Kingsway, which is like a, a foodies hub. You've got a massive market of people. He said it's not for sale. And I told him like, I will get everything's for sale. You just <laughs> gotta work out a price. I've never bought a business before, yeah, right? right? So okay. I was like, I better study and figure out what information do you need to know what the business is based on? Like, is it based on the sales right. or lease? This I'm studying online, spoke to a couple of guys in hospitality and they said, look, you know, when you're buying a restaurant, for example, or any sort of hospitality business, whether it's a cafe, bar, whatever it is, they go, it's based on uh, the turnover. So turnover times X. I've got the formula, I don't have the figures. You know what, I'll go old school. There's a car wash shot opposite, pen and pay by, sat there for two weeks. I was like, I'll be there on Monday, out through to Sunday, Friday, Saturday, you would assume is busier. Pen and paper, and I'm like, all right, that guy bought one kebab, and I'll write down, like, I'll write down, for example, person one, X amount of spence. I was close enough that the guy could seriously do that. And I was just trying to learn and understand the finances of this business. Right. Based on what his business is actually worth, I offered a lot more, right. but only because I could see the potential in that location. So he wasn't utilizing that as he should. 
he was pretty happy with the alpha and at that time like no one thought of that spot as anything and uh yeah that's how we had the acquisition of that uh the location yeah so then from starting the business what research did you have to do especially being a hospitality yeah. business what did you have to do in order to get things up and running uh everything <laughs> i like i said I, I don't have any uh experience in hospitality at all so i did i had one friend come in he helped a lot actually he used to run yaraman kebabs right, okay. and uh, he was quite popular for a while he came in he showed me look obviously how to set up things things need to run in sort of like a systematic system so like if i'm staying there i don't want to be reaching over there i need to you know, everything needs to be put in a way so everything runs smoothly nice. staff can sort of pass things around you can buy cheap and you're just going to buy over and over again he goes it stings it always stings like anyone in business is going to feel that sting when you spend a lot of money on something but in the long run it, it saves money like nice. it saves okay. it, it a peace of mind so he showed me all of that and when it came to like the whole food preparation because we weren't open he couldn't show me how to prepare food Number one is when I'd go to other restaurants, I'd be that weird guy, sort of just really, you know, I was really staring. I was like, oh, okay, that's how they do that. Like, I had no idea. I had no idea. I was making chips for some of the boys and um, I was just giving them out. I was like, guys, give me some feedback. And the boys were like, stop giving us Air Maxes. I'm like, what's an Air Max? They're like, the chips, they got nothing in them because I was overcooking them. So I had to learn. I'm like, all right, well, even with the meat, I started YouTubing you know, Turkish kebab shops and man, they've got these massive meats and these guys got these swords. I was like, all right, so that's how it's done. That's how I'm going to do it, the traditional way. Right. So I went and bought a sword, probably not the right sword, but I bought a sword and I use the word sword because it was not a knife, it was a sword. <laughs> yeah, anyways, the chicken's on a rotisserie cooking and I'm cutting it and it's not easy, man. Like with a sword, you're sort of missing parts or whatever. So like it's all cooked, right. but it just doesn't look consistent. One piece is big, one piece is small. It's all a bit all over the place. I only did that for one day because straight away the guy came in, my uh, chicken supplier, he goes, I said, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm all proud of myself, I'm shaving the chicken. He's like, where's your slicer? I'm like, what's a slicer? And he's like, let's wait an hour, I'll get one organized for you. I'm like, yeah, no worries. Anyways, he brings along the slicer. It's this little electric thing. You just, man, like, I was just like, wow, like, this is crazy. I learned, I learned, yes. I had to, I, the good thing is I had people helping me out. Yeah. And then as we sort of progressed and we kept uh, going, so we had our soft opening and we just got like pumped. Right. So I was like, all right, we are definitely understaffed. Like it was me and my brother. I'm like, can't do this, me and my brother. We started hiring staff. You got to learn from the staff what they bring in because some of them have ex uh, experience at a restaurant so like yes. for example i didn't know how to cut i yes. told you i had no experience so i'm cutting lettuce like my lettuce was bad right <laughs> like i was cutting lettuce really bad and this girl came along and um she's like i started doing it. i'm like cutting lettuce she goes no you're destroying the lettuce i was like all right, all right. And so she showed me so the point is like i brought someone else along to hire them to my team but they nice. brought their experience along nice. and someone else had good customer service experience because they're in retail and he brought that along so i'm even though I'm trying to teach in my business, they're teaching me aspects of the business that I otherwise don't know. I was like a sponge, man. I just had to take in as much as I could because I was really good at business and yeah. marketing. That was what I was good at, but food, no idea. Did that scare you? Because people that feel like they, they don't have any experience in a particular industry, they won't go and jump into it. What made you do that and how did you learn so quickly? Yeah, look, it, it is scary. Like, yeah. Look, dude, I can market it incredibly. Yeah. It was like, I can make us appear online to be like this cool, great thing. But if you're making your food sound great, it has to be great. So like, that was a scary part. So obviously we learned, but it shouldn't deter anyone. I wouldn't let it deter anybody. If there's something you don't know, it just means it's something you can learn and get good at, you know? So without boasting, like we, there's no kebab shop in Melbourne that yeah. comes close to us. So people say, from what perspective? I go, look, put aside finances or put aside the popularity. There is no shop, and like I can tell you guys, there is no shop in Melbourne that goes through as much product as we do. And that's from a guy who had no experience in food, so. How, do you think it's important for people to have a business plan? Yes, I think you gotta have a plan, but I think more than a plan, you gotta have action. Like mm -hmm. our, my whole thing sprung into action because of action. I didn't yeah. have a plan at that point. Yeah. When I first took over, I was like, I want a shop. Why do I want a shop? Not sure. What's gonna be my customer base? Not sure. Um, you know, how we're gonna grow or overcome obstacles, no idea. Right. I was like, first, let's just get it and go from there. So I would say an action is uh, key. You need to take action. There's no point having a plan if you're not gonna take action. Okay. And then, so when you were going through the whole process of that, a key thing that you've mentioned is you were able to make your presence look huge. You had a good network. Yeah. How important was that for the business? Uh, for us, it worked very well. So like, like I said, at the beginning, me and my brother were sort of worried if we we're gonna make ends meet or if it like because you have that man when you go into a new business you don't know what's gonna yeah, happen exactly. are you gonna be able to pay your first rent 
Are you going to be able to pay the staff? Like, are you going to go bust in the first year? Like, you don't know. We had no idea. Because of my networking in the past from those events and stuff I was telling you about, my reach within so many different groups and organizations was quite big. So wow. when we first started, we had a lot of support. Like this whole um, thing with cars and bikes and Glenny Kebabs and being sort of affiliated constantly, whether it's on a, our official Wednesday nights, which was our Wednesday night event, yeah. or even Friday and Saturdays, everyone knew like that's the place you go to. The very first week before we officially opened, wow. we had a soft opening, wow. we were there. And it was, it was just happened to be a Wednesday and the boys were bored and they told me they're going to come past and see me. I'm like, yeah, no worries. Anyways, they came past on a Wednesday and they came past in some RX-7s. Like if you're in a car scene, RX-7s are sort of like a, a special car. Yeah. I'm biased because yeah. I had an RX-7, <laughs> but they are a special car. And um, anyways, we had some parked up and then the next week I uh, had all these guys and I, you know, I didn't know who they were. I'm still new in business. I was like, hey guys, how you going? You know, what brings you here today? And they said, oh, our friends saw uh, there was a car meet here. I'm like, what, what made you guys say that? They go, last week there was a car meet here. And, the reason I bring this up is if I didn't have friends with those RX-7s and it was just some average cars parked, it wouldn't have done much. But because it was those particular cars with a particular presence, it brought attention. Right. And then that we came and people came. A week after, more people came thinking there's a car meet. There wasn't a car meet, but they just thought there was. So after about a month or so, we're like, let's make it official. Wednesday night chills is a Glenny Kebabs car meet. The thing is like, once you get them into your business once, any business, like haven't been to that store, don't know who we are, but you came once and you enjoyed that vibe. You're like, hey, this is cool. Like I just met this guy, I've seen a friend I haven't seen in years. And you just, the food is good. You just enjoy everything overall. But knowing people helps a lot, man. Like a site is notorious for Facebook statuses asking for this trade or that trade and I did it and the reason I did it is I'm like yeah I can google it and find some random guy but why not pay someone within your circle so so it seems like you've built a huge community especially around cars bikes how important is I guess fueling a community and how much does it support a business oh that's uh it's very important so like like I said our business catapulted because of the whole cars and bikes and the whole Wednesday night chills at one stage we moved so we closed our outdoor restaurant and we moved to an indoor restaurant now indoors, you can't have cars and bikes, yeah. right? So we had this indoor restaurant running for maybe about seven months. And we damn, we got bombarded like, hey guys, are you doing another event? Hey guys, we missed the Glenny Kebabs Wednesday night chills. And I was like, look, I understand like people miss it, but like, I can't host a night because we're indoors. Like, yeah. you, know, there's, you can't, I, I, left a bike, I left my motorbike parked out here for a year, uh, about a year right. because same thing, people like that. Hey, look, there's still, there's still some affiliation here with that car and bike scene. But um, that's as far as we could go. Even on a grand opening, we had some gold plate at Harley Davidson's and stuff parked. And so I, just to give people that reminder, like, yeah, we're not going to have meats, but we're still the same guys. So I said, I wanted to give the people, you had got an interesting story about when you first started from Caltex and then you had to, I guess, move yeah. from Caltex yeah. and then you were seeking out a new place. What was that transition like? And what was that uh, backstory as well? The backstory was, Lease is very important, so anyone taking on a new business, make sure you read through your lease and understand the lease very well. What happened with us with that is we took on, we, so we became a subtenant of Caltex in Glen Webley. Yes. And that Caltex was run under a franchise system. So there was like you and I, just a local guy running a business and that was it. Now where we were sitting was near the car wash and there's right and wrong look our business grew a lot quicker than we had anticipated wow. and that's great and we were very happy for that but there came the backlash too which was parking became an issue and people were sort of spilling over to the petrol station side now the petrol station at that time did not mind because yes we took over the car wash area for example where people are spending coin but the in-store sales had quadrupled and more so on a wednesday they went up six seven fold on a normal sort of day-to-day -day basis it went up three four fold so they were happy so after the first two years head office started to take over right. right that's where all the problems started and they went down the other route it didn't make any sense it still doesn't make sense to me where they're overseeing all the financial gains and were like that's our side that's your side i'm like well and uh they started making little complaints so they were unhappy with that we had too many tables and chairs because our tables and chairs were in our parking area I'm like i'm like but it's in my parking area i'm like yes but because it's in your parking area you reduce your parking spots and now people might spill over to ours they just weren't happy and then after that they're like we don't want any car parking except for three cars at your spot i'm like it wasn't reasonable like this went a bit too hard so we had got our lawyers involved and it went to the process of where they wanted to evict us we obviously didn't want to leave because that's our that's home. Smart, yeah. um, so I went back and forward, they went to the judge, even the um, at court, the, the, the person in charge was like, well, you guys need to do something, put up some parking lines, which they eventually did. So anyways, I was in the, under the impression that look, we're not gonna stay here much longer because either A, they don't want us here, or two, with the conditions they're gonna put on us, it's gonna limit our growth. And in right. business, you don't wanna be limited, you right. wanna constantly grow. Anyways, going back to Caltech, so that got into disputes, 
And it got to the point where like, we won. And I was really happy about that because like, it was like a pretty small business. We took Caltex to court and we won in the sense that their objection was to get us out then and there. We put an injunction, we won that and we were granted permission to stay. We had a lot of support from like the community we're talking about. So like at one stage, kids uh, organized a protest. I didn't even know about it. I remember the cops called me up once. They're like, hey, Saad, are you aware of the protest? I'm like, what protest? He's like, oh, some kids have organized a protest. I'm like, good on them. He's like, well, did you not know about this? I'm like, no, I don't know about it. Yeah. We ended up being uh, interviewed. I was ended up being on the Channel 10, the project yeah, show. Yes, yes, so I uh, yes. was on there. We ended up being on the front page of the Herald, the Age, um, the, the Leader, like every news, the Daily Mail, like every newspaper jumped on top of it and had headlines along the lines of David versus Goliath or right. small business owner versus corporate giant or something along those lines. Anyway, so we won that, but then they put those restrictions on us and then I was like, well, how are you going to grow? Like, how do we grow knowing that we can only have X amount of people here at a given time? We can only have X amount of cars here at a given time. Like, they've really put us down this uh, chokehold. I'm like, well, we need to get out. Nine months I was active. I was talking to real estate agents. I was on um, commercial estate and just looking, 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 trying to find whatever fills my prerequisites to have a new shop. And then eventually some other guy approached out to me was this place here. Right. So this used to be called Burger Edge. Yes. And it was yes. a burger place and he was just very upfront. He just told me, he goes, look, the business is dying. The, the brand is not really keeping up. And uh, if you're interested, we'd like you to run this place, but as Burger Edge. So I told him, I go, look, can we run it as Burger Edge, but still sort of squeeze in some of our menu yeah, items? Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. reason I wanted to do that is worst case scenario, if we're not there, then I could renegotiate with him saying, look, let's do a Glenny kebab slash Burger Edge or something or other. Yeah. He was he was more than happy because like the so number one, the franchise is not making him money. He's not getting his royalty fees. And on top of that, he's getting sucked dry for the lease. Anyways, we met up with head office for Century City Walk. They were very skeptical at first. They don't, they're, like, they're like, who are you? to come to us to try and set yourself up in our establishment because you know they're sort of playing with all the big business here they got strike and village cinemas they've got char time they've got um tab like these are all big well-renowned businesses yes. throughout australia yes. and then there's me a guy across the road running a business from a little kebab kiosk so they were a bit uncomfortable anyways they started imposing some terms on me i wasn't happy with them at all because i told them what we can bring to the table so i told them look the center's been getting quieter as time has progressed yeah, i'm yeah, england yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah i live yeah. here I know two years back that Century City Walk was popping, like it was always peaking. What's happened is a lot of the big businesses have moved to Kingsway and everyone, everyone's running Kingsway. So I told them, this is the numbers we pull in at our current shop. I'm like, we, we, we serve hundreds of people a day, like hundreds. I go on a Wednesday, we serve up to four, 500 people a day. On an average day, we're seeing face to face three to 400 people a day. And they're like, look, we're not worried about that. We're worried about the image of the business and how you're going to conduct yourself, how your patrons are going to conduct themselves. I'm like, okay, well, what is it that you, because I was trying to figure out what they wanted. Like, oh, we, we want you to serve your kebabs and uh, plates and cut cutlery. I'm like, well, it's a kebab. I go, you don't eat a kebab with yeah. plates and cutlery. We don't want any uh, packaging. We don't want anything yeah. to throw away. We don't want you to serve um, Coke inside a bottle. It has to be in a glass. I'm like, well, no, that does not fit in with what we are. Right. Anyways, I literally left the meeting. I go, look, guys, thanks for your time. I'm not interested. Like, I made it very clear. This is only going to be a loss to them, not to everyone around. A couple of weeks later, I got a phone call. They're like, look aside, we'd like you to come in and we'll discuss uh, things with you again. I'm like, no worries. And now I knew that I had them. Right. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to play this different game. This is what I want. Right. If you guys want me, this is what I want. I go, I'm going to be serving food how I want it. I go, the conditions you guys will put on me, I go, I'm not happy with them. They agreed to everything I said. <laughs> everything I said they agreed to and we took on the lease. So that's uh, how we got into Glen Waverley Century City Walk. Yeah. Right. All right, guys, in the next segment, Asad is going to teach us how to negotiate with your suppliers. Hey, guys, now LinkedIn is a powerful tool when you are looking for your next job. I'm going to give you three tips around how you can improve your LinkedIn profile. Tip number one, make sure that you have a clear photo of yourself. Remember that you want to have a clear background and also make sure that you are smiling so you look approachable. Tip number two, in the about section, make sure that you have a call to action. So what you wanna do is state who you are, what type of jobs you are looking for, and what experience that you have. Now, this only needs to be a paragraph. Tip number three, when you are creating your LinkedIn profile, make sure to always keep this in mind. This is your virtual online resume. So recruiters will be looking at that and they want to see what type of information that you have. So when you are putting your job roles on there, make sure to use bullet points, highlighting what you've done in that current job that will then help other organizations.
All right, guys, so I'm Asad. The first tip I can give you guys is being able to negotiate with your suppliers. A supplier might be able to give you a list of their prices. Don't go with that list. Get a couple of suppliers. I usually go for two, three different suppliers. One will generally be the one you want to go with. They'll have uh, most of the prices at what you're looking for with a couple of exceptions. With those exceptions, take it to them. Say, look guys, we're happy with the prices that you have for your first 20 products. The other 10, we can get cheaper from this supplier. Can you match them? If they can, excellent, go with that supplier. If not, let them know, look guys, we're going to be buying these products off the other party. Generally, what will happen is either they will just accept the, the price and you've got one great supplier, or you can sort of just uh, spread your supplies over. Uh, the second tip I could suggest to you is staff. Staff are absolutely crucial in the business. Um, they're going to come to you with their own requests. You're obviously going to have your own demands. Don't have to knock back all the staff members. At the same time, don't take on all staff members. Yeah, the staff members got to suit you and your business and it's got to make life easier for you. At the same time, they want to be comfortable and make money on the days they want to work. So what with that, I would do is find out the days you need, find out what days they're willing to work and negotiate. Like sometimes we get a lot of young guys that come along and they say, look, we don't want to work weekends. Have your Saturday or Friday night off, work with us the other day. On the night that you do want off, maybe work that day. So that way they've still got their weekend, you've still got your staff and you've got that sort of negotiation. So that's set and that works out for both parties. The third tip I can give you is about lease. Once you're in a lease, that's your lifeline for the duration of that business. So if you're in a lease for seven years, you can't in the middle of it then change terms and conditions. It's very hard to do that. So what you wanna do is establish something at the beginning and understand business is gonna grow, business is gonna change, see if they're gonna have flexibility, see what clauses can and cannot be changed. Like some businesses will tell you, look, we can give you a lease for 10 plus 10 plus year 10. Uh, I would change that to maybe three plus three plus three plus three. What that means is you can leave after three years if business is not working for you. But at the same time, if the business is doing great for you, you can extend that lease on for longer. Lease is going to be presented to you as something that you can't negotiate on. Not entirely true. If you've got a good team backing you up, you can change the lease to suit you and your business for the future.